This is a homily for the 26th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The first reading is from the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verses 25 to 29. The second reading is from the letter of St. James, chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. And the gospel for this Sunday comes from the gospel of St. Mark, chapter 9, verses 38 to 43, and verses 47 and 48. In today's Gospel, we are still on pilgrimage with Jesus and the disciples as they make their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Passover. On this journey, Jesus tells the disciples three times what awaits him in Jerusalem. The first of these three prophecies of the Passion is in chapter 8, the second in chapter 9, and the third in chapter 10. And how do the disciples react to these prophecies of the Passion? Following the first prophecy, Peter rebukes Jesus. Following the second prophecy, Mark tells us that the disciples did not understand what he had said and were afraid to ask him. They then argue among themselves about which of them is the greatest. After the third prophecy, the two brothers James and John approach Jesus, asking him to grant them positions at his right hand and at his left when he enters into his glory. It is obvious that the disciples have failed to understand the call to discipleship. So after each of these three reactions, Jesus teaches the disciples. Here we have the first of these three teachings. The disciples must renounce self, take up the cross and follow Jesus. Whoever wants to save life will lose it. But whoever loses life for the sake of Jesus and for the sake of the gospel will save it. The second teaching. Anyone who wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Whoever welcomes a little child in the name of Jesus welcomes him. And whoever welcomes him welcomes not him but the one who sent him. And finally... Whoever wants to become great must become a servant to all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here we have the essence of discipleship. Renouncing self, taking up the cross and following Jesus, losing one's life for the sake of Jesus and for the sake of the gospel becoming servant of all, and welcoming the powerless. But the disciples have so far failed to learn these lessons, and for that reason Mark frames the journey to Jerusalem between two stories of Jesus healing a blind man. In today's Gospel, which follows immediately after last Sunday's Gospel, it's clear that the disciples still can't see. They still fail to understand what it means to be a disciple. John approaches Jesus, obviously speaking on behalf of the other disciples. Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us, driving our demons in your name. And because he does not follow us, we tried to stop him. John is still thinking in terms of privilege and power. He is far less focused on the good being done by this exorcist who is not one of the twelve. And far more concerned that an outsider is usurping a prerogative of the disciples. John obviously believes that the disciples should have an exclusive monopoly over the brand name of Jesus. It's as though the disciples are saying, We're card-carrying apostles. We have exclusive rights to the Jesus franchise. 
No one else but one of us is authorised to cast out devils in the name of Jesus. But John receives a mild rebuke from Jesus. Do not stop him. No one who works a deed of power in my name could soon afterwards speak evil of me. Anyone who is not against us is for us. The main thing for Jesus is that people are being set free from the power of Satan and set free for fullness of life in God's kingdom. This episode explains the choice of the first reading of today's Mass. As you know, the first reading is chosen because in one way or another it complements the theme of the Gospel. So the first reading comes from the book of Numbers and it tells about an incident that occurred during the Exodus. The people were constantly complaining about one thing after another. All of a sudden, slavery in Egypt didn't seem so bad. Moses in turn complains to God, I cannot carry all these people on my own. The weight is too much for me. God then offers a solution. He tells Moses, Collect me seventy of the elders of Israel, men you know to be the people's elders and scribes. Bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them stand beside you there. The tent of meeting was like a portable temple. It was the dwelling place of God among his people until the temple was eventually built in Jerusalem. God tells Moses, I shall come down and talk to you there and shall take some of the spirit which is on you and put it on them. Then they will bear the burden of the people with you and you will no longer have to bear it on your own. Today's first reading tells us that the Spirit did come down upon the elders gathered in the tent of meeting, but not all 70 of them were present in the tent. Two were missing. The two missing elders were Eldad and Medad. However, even though they were not present in the tent when the Spirit came down, they nevertheless began to prophesy in the camp. Joshua, who is to become the successor of Moses, is put out by this. He appeals to Moses. My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses replies, Are you jealous on my account? If only the whole people of Israel were prophets, and the Lord gave his spirit to them all. The large-heartedness of both Moses and Jesus stands out. They are each saying to their followers something like this, Get rid of your own sense of distinctiveness and privilege, and be prepared to find and rejoice in goodness wherever it exists. The fact that God has chosen you doesn't mean that God has also given you an exclusive monopoly in carrying out His work in the world. We now come to some more sayings of Jesus about discipleship, sayings that seem harsh and uncompromising. If your hand should cause you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life crippled than to have two hands and go to hell, into the fire that can never be put out. And if your foot should cause you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye should cause you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Cut it off, tear it out. These drastic measures are clearly not intended to be carried out in a literal sense. Jesus is talking about the supreme value of life in the kingdom of God. God's kingdom is of such overriding importance that we must be prepared to act vigorously against anything in our lives that would jeopardize our life in God's kingdom. 
If the image of cutting off sounds too harsh, let's use the gentler image of letting go. What must I let go of? The more traditional word for this is detachment. In 600 AD, at the age of 75, John Climacus was persuaded by the monks of St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Desert to become their abbot. As abbot, he wrote a guide to the spiritual life that became a classic. It's called The Ladder of Divine Ascent. It was the title of this work that led to his being known as John of the Ladder, or in the Greek, Ioannes te Klimakos. The Greek word Klimakos is the genitive of Klimax, the word for ladder. The Ladder of Divine Ascent is the most popular work in all of Eastern Christendom and it's read every Lent in all Orthodox monasteries throughout the world. John likens the Christian life to ascending a ladder with 30 rungs, one rung for each of the 30 years of Jesus' life before he began his public ministry. Here you can see a 12th century icon at St. Catherine's, which is inspired by John's book. It shows monks ascending and falling from the ladder to heaven. Winged demons armed with bows and arrows make the ascent difficult, but Jesus, with outstretched arms, welcomes those who reach the top of the ladder. We can be fairly certain that John Climacus borrowed the image of a ladder between heaven and earth from a story that's found in the book of Genesis a story about the patriarch Jacob. Jacob is travelling from Bathsheba in the south to Haran in the north, but at sunset he stops to rest for the night. That night, as he sleeps, he dreams of a ladder set up between heaven and earth, and angels of God are ascending and descending on it. He then hears the voice of the Lord saying, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your descendants. John adapts this image. His ladder has 30 rungs. 16 represent vices that we must overcome. 14 are virtues to acquire. The first three rungs of the ladder obviously represent three essential virtues that the disciple must acquire if he or she is to ascend higher. They are renunciation, detachment and exile. In other words, we renounce, cut off or tear out anything that is a stumbling block to our call to discipleship. Clive Hamilton's book entitled Affluenza is subtitled When Too Much Is Never Enough. Affluenza is a coined word derived from the two words affluence and influenza, suggesting that our relentless pursuit of affluence has become a disease. Hamilton says that affluenza describes a condition in which we are confused about what it takes to live a worthwhile life. Part of this confusion is a failure to distinguish between what we want and what we need. It can be described as the bloated, sluggish and unfulfilled feeling that results from efforts to keep up with the Joneses. It is a growing and unhealthy preoccupation with money and material things. We derive our identity and sense of place in the world through our consumption activity. Hamilton offers this reflection. As a rule, no matter how much money people have, they feel they need more. 
Why else would people in rich countries such as Australia keep striving to become richer, often at the expense of their own happiness and that of their families? Even the mega-rich seem unable to accept that they have all they need, always comparing themselves unfavourably with their neighbours. Most people cling to the belief that more money means more happiness. People rationalise it this way. I hope that getting to this income level would make me feel contented. I do have more stuff, but it doesn't seem to have done the trick. I obviously need to set my goals higher. I'm sure I'll be happy when I'm earning an extra $10,000 because then I'll be able to buy the other things I want. Think of it this way. This is me here and now. See the empty spaces. They represent everything that I lack. Now here is the perfect me. Notice all the empty spaces have been filled. But how do I do that? How do I fill the emptiness? The obvious answer is, I fill the empty spaces with more stuff. However, it's not stuff that's the problem. As Hamilton points out, It is not money and material possessions that are the root of the problem. It is our attachment to them and the way they condition our thinking, give us our self-identification and rule our lives. The problem is not that people own things. The problem is that things own people. Writing hundreds of years earlier... St. John of the Cross diagnosed the same problem in these words. We are not talking here about giving up things, because that does not strip the soul if her effective drive remains set on them. We are talking about stripping away the craving for gratification, gusto, appetito, in those things. That is what leaves the person free and empty in their regard, even though she still owns them, because it is not the things of this world that take up space in the person or do her harm. No, it is the will and the hunger for them that dwells inside her. Not only do the prosperous hunger for more, they are so often oblivious to the plight of the poor. In today's second reading, St. James warns the wealthy, Your wealth is rotting, your clothes are moth-eaten, your gold and silver are rusting away, and the same rust will be a witness against you and eat into your body like fire. New Testament scholar Diane Bergant offers this reflection. The wealthy have foolishly and ravenously hoarded the treasures of the earth. Preoccupied with their own comfort, they have ignored the needs of others. Clothes are moth-eaten when they are not worn. This suggests that the wealthy have not only amassed more than they need, but they have failed to share their abundance with those who suffer want. The same is true about their gold and silver. Although these metals do not really rust, as the reading suggests, the description emphasises the lack of generosity on the part of the wealthy. They have been busy accruing money rather than sharing it with the poor, and this selfish attitude will be a testimony against them. Evelyn Underhill's 1911 classic Mysticism, a study in nature and development of spiritual consciousness, identifies several stages on what she calls the mystic way. The mystic way, or we could call it the call to discipleship, begins with the awakening of the self. It continues with the purification of the self, and that leads to the illumination of the self. 
She writes, All conversion entails the abrupt or gradual emergence of intuitions from below the threshold, the consequent remaking of the field of consciousness, and the alteration in the self's attitude to the world. In most cases, the onset of this new consciousness is the result of a long period of restlessness, uncertainty and mental stress. The deeper mind stirs uneasily in its prison, and its emergence is but the last of many efforts to escape. St. Augustine describes this restlessness in these words, You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Dante's The Divine Comedy also begins with what we could describe as restlessness. In the middle of our life's way, I found myself in a dark wood where the right way was lost. How must Dante proceed? Before entering Paradiso, he must first descend to the depths of the Inferno, the depths of hell, before slowly ascending through Purgatorio. Underhill describes this process of purification this way. What must be the first step of the self upon this road to perfect union with the Absolute? Clearly, a getting rid of all those elements of normal experience which are not in harmony with reality, of illusion, evil, imperfection of every kind. By false desires and false thoughts, people build up for themselves a false universe. This involves a kind of death, the death of the ego that we feed so voraciously. Ironically, this self-preoccupation holds us back from our best selves. The American writer Joseph Campbell has written extensively on the subject of myth. One of his most popular works is entitled The Hero with a Thousand Faces. The significance of the title is the realisation that the heroic figure in many of the great stories of humanity, embarks upon what is essentially the same journey of discovery. Whether the story be Homer's Iliad or Odyssey, or the story of King Arthur in Camelot, Robin Hood in Sherwood Forest, Hopalong Cassidy in the American West, Tarzan in the jungles of Africa, Luke Skywalker in a distant galaxy, Jason and the Argonauts, or even Bilbo Baggins the Hobbit, deep in the lonely mountain. We are essentially hearing the same story. Only the face of the hero and the setting of the story change. And why would we be interested in the hero's journey? We are interested in the hero's journey because the story of the hero is our own story writ large. Campbell outlines a number of key stages in the journey of the hero, beginning with the call to adventure. This is precisely what is happening to Dante the Pilgrim in the Dark Wood. You're in a mess. You're lost. You're floundering. You have to do something. This involves crossing a threshold, and here we encounter what Campbell calls the guardian of the threshold. The guardian symbolises those intimidating forces from both within and without that discourage us from embarking upon the adventure, the fear of failure, the loss of safety and security, fear of leaping into the unknown, and the fear of what others will think. Sometimes, however, the voice of the guardian must be heeded. Not every call to adventure will be life-giving. The hero may refuse the call. In two weeks' time, we'll have an opportunity to reflect upon the refusal of the call 
when we hear the story of the man who asks Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life. If the hero embarks upon the adventure, he or she must undergo a death experience. They must enter the belly of the whale. The belly of the whale refers, of course, to the story of Jonah. God calls Jonah. Up, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out to them that their wickedness has come before me. Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria, and it was Assyria that had wiped out the northern kingdom of Israel in the 8th century BC. Jonah has no love for the Ninevites. Nineveh is 965 kilometres to the northeast. So Jonah runs away as far as possible in the opposite direction, boarding a ship bound for Tarshish, some 3,540 kilometres to the west. How often have we all been guilty of doing that? God tells us to go in one direction and we head off in directly the opposite direction. Soon, however, a huge storm arises and the terrified sailors realise that a storm like this, coming suddenly out of nowhere, must be the result of someone on board offending their God. Jonah admits that he is fleeing from the Lord's presence and tells the sailors that if they cast him overboard, the storm will subside. So they cast Jonah into the sea, and he is swallowed by a giant fish, often referred to as a whale. Jonah remains inside the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, until he's regurgitated onto land. A second time, God commands Jonah, Up! Go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the message I tell you. This time, Jonah does as the Lord commands. The belly of the whale is a death experience. In Jonah's case, it is the death of his own willfulness, of his own rebellion against God. In her book, Necessary Losses, the American writer Judith Vierost makes this observation. I've learnt that in the course of our life we leave and are left and let go of much that we love. Losing is the price we pay for living. It is also the source of much of our growth and gain. Making our way from birth to death, we also have to make our way through the pain of giving up and giving up and giving up some portion of what we cherish. We have to deal with our necessary losses. She concludes the book with this reflection. There is plenty we have to give up in order to grow, for we cannot deeply love anything without becoming vulnerable to loss. And we cannot become separate people, responsible people, connected people, reflective people, without some losing and leaving and letting go. On the day that the Cistercian monk Thomas Merton began his solitary life as a hermit, he asked the Gethsemane community to pray for him. And when you pray for me, all I ask that you pray for is that, above all, I should completely forget my own will and completely surrender to the will of God, because this is all I want to do. The death experience leads us to what Underhill calls the illumination of the self. The self emerges from long and varied acts of purification to find that it is able to apprehend another order of reality. It has achieved consciousness of a world that was always there. Such a beholding, such a lifting of consciousness from a self-centred to a God-centred world is the essence 
of illumination. The Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar identifies two different dramas that we can live out in life. The ego drama or the theodrama. The theodrama is a life lived with God at the centre. The ego drama is all about me. I want to write the script for the drama of my own life. I'm directing it. I'm the producer. But most of all, I play the starring role. It's all about me. The journey from restlessness through renunciation to illumination is a journey from the ego drama, a self-centered world, to the theodrama, a God-centered world. Mark's Gospel is about a journey, a journey from the Galilee region in the north to Jerusalem in the south. But it is also about an inner journey, the journey of discipleship, the journey from the ego drama to the theo drama. And Mark's Gospel offers us a map for this journey.